Our Pentium Packup Bell series is perhaps the longest ever seen on this channel. Hello, cave dwellers. Yes, it's taken so long that we built an entire lab and extended the cave around the machine. But here we are, the final episode where we're going to tie up all of the odds and ends. We're going to make this look, I hope, just like it does in the catalogue. And then we're going to find a spot, a spot which I've earmarked in the cave already, to put it, to present it nicely for you and for anyone who comes and visits. And from that spot, I want to create an IBM PC Compatibles corner. So we'll see some other PCs later on today, if all goes to plan. But first of all, I want to take you through a big old pile of deliveries that are going to help us get this to its final form, starting with the very catalogue that I mentioned. Let's take a look at it. We'd like to thank PCBWay.com for supporting our episode today. They aren't just about PCBs, although they do do a tremendous job of that. They also offer CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, 3D printing and injection moulding. If you're creating, then PCBWay.com can help you bring your project to life. Get an instant quote now over at PCBWay.com and we thank them for their support. Now we have seen this catalogue in the past because I found a PDF of it and I showed it to you in previous episodes. So when it came up on eBay, I just had to buy it. I think I spent less than five pounds on it, but that's still an obscene amount of money for such a skinny pamphlet. But I thought it'd be a really nice thing to have next to the machine for visitors to look at, flick through, see what software was included, see what the, um, the feel and the buzzwords of the day were. So this is very much focused on surfing the internet with the included modem. Start surfing the internet from the comfort of your home and Packard Bell's welcome present, the first month's free subscription with 10 hours free access on CompuServe in America online, excluding telephone dial-up costs. I'm not sure how long uh, 20 hours of free access would last me these days, but multimedia and internet access was all the rage at this time. In the center, we can see the two desktop and the two tower models, prices ranging from £1,399, including VAT, all the way up to £2,500 for the top of the range tower model. But you'll remember when we looked at the recovered files on the machine before, it included a Lexmark printer driver. It was looking for the printer and there was a pop-up in Publisher notifying me that it couldn't find it. Well, if we look on the back page of this catalog, we can see there is a Packard Bell multimedia PC and color printer package Christmas special, save 120 pounds. And that does indeed show a Packard Bell badged printer. But underneath that, it says buy Lexmark. So it's just a, a rebadged Lexmark printer. So it could well indeed be that this was purchased as part of this package for £1,779, including the VAT. And these are all the bits that came with it. The microphone, the remote control, and the one-touch access panel, which sits under the monitor, which I've so desperately been trying to find. Did I find one? Well, let's go through the rest of the items that I've got on the pile here to show you. The next thing on the pile is an original Packard Bell CD collection. This could be really important because I want to restore it all the way back to factory defaults. Although we've got it working, my floppy drive and my CD-ROM drive weren't showing up in Windows and there were just some kind of random bugs and crashes. Now that could just be Windows being Windows um, of the era, or it could be that some files weren't quite recovered correctly when we uh, undeleted all the files from the old hard disk. So let's go with a clean install if we can, and that's going to depend on these discs being the correct ones for the machine. We've got the master CD there, but we've also got included that £1,000 package of software that's advertised in the magazine. So that includes such things as an electronic library. Uh, there is a Windows 95 standalone disc there. I'm not sure if that would have been included originally, as well as the master CD. I guess it must have been. And then we've got Packard Bell branded discs for Civilization 2, Civnet, so a few games on there. Comic Zone and Echo the Dolphin, so a couple of Sega games there. The Adventures of Batman and Robin Cartoon Maker. I'll just let you look through these as I lay them out on the table. Coral Word Perfect, Michelangelo Demo, Student Reference Library, and Microsoft Oceans. So that's your £1,000 worth of bundled software. It doesn't look quite as impressive when it's not shown in all the big boxes as it shows it in the catalogue. It's just a pile of discs. But if you got this on Christmas Day or whenever you got your Packard Bell, it would have kept you busy for a while. Whether or not you wanted to learn French with Asterix, you would have given it a go just to see video uh, streaming from CD and all of the other multimedia capabilities that your machine might have had. So the important one here is the master CD. I'll put that to one side so that we can try and restore this system back to exactly how it came out of the box. And then if that works, we can try a bunch of these CDs and see how it works. See if the uh, Packard Bell Navigator keeps stuttering as it did in the last episode, Max Headroom style. 
The next thing we've got here is the remote control. We've managed to get hold of a remote control and also the receiver that plugs into the serial port to go with it. That will very much be dependent on the right software being included for this to work. It won't just work out of the box with Windows. So a remote control, it's not a bad thing to be honest. I've seen much cheaper remote controls in my time. If we look inside, there is no sign of the green ooze of battery damage. So thankfully this has been stored without batteries in and there's a good chance that will work. So we will give that a go. When it comes to the microphone, I couldn't find the Packard Bell specific microphone to go with it. I'm sure a lot of these came out of the same factory. So the best I could do was I found a Creative Labs. This is the SD50, similar style microphone, looks slightly different, but it comes boxed, which is nice. And if I pull it out of the box there, we can slot it into its stand. There we go, and it's, it's a bendy mic. I can position it however I want to. Clean up on aisle four, please. I think that's close enough to what it looks like in the catalog. I'll always keep an eye out to see if I can come up with the actual Packard Bell one, but this probably is a tiny bit better than what was bundled. I don't know. It's a cheap microphone, however you look at it, but uh, it'll do the job for that final look. Once again, what is wrong with me? I'm trying to source all of these things, but hopefully it'll all come together at the end. And then finally this, this is the bit that I've been looking for for so long, the Packard Bell Media Select. It's actually boxed incredibly. I'm not sure that this has ever been used. I'm sure it would have come in the big box packaging with the PC originally in its own Media Select box like this. I don't think this was sold separately. Have a look inside and it's back in peanuts, my favorite. Let's get these out of the way. This does look to be completely unused. The cable's still cable tied. The user guide is there with tips on setting up your Media Select. And then this is the unit itself. So it's designed to sit under the monitor. The monitor sits on top of this, which will protect the case a little bit. And then you have your buttons at the front of the PC. And there is here a pass-through for the mouse. So it actually plugs into the PS2 mouse port and then the mouse plugs into this, which is um, slightly odd. So hopefully that won't need any configuration other than the master CD, but we'll find out shortly. Can't believe we found a brand new one. It's amazing. And then one final thing that I picked up, it's not necessary, but uh, it might help with the longevity of the machine. It's always a good idea to keep chips as cool as you can. So this is a StarTech Socket 7 um, CPU heatsink and fan, and you can buy these brand new. You can still buy brand new Socket 7 CPU coolers. And here it is in the box here. It's got his own little packet of thermal grease in there and a, a Molex pass through so he can easily get power into that. And that can sit on top of our Pentium and just keep it cool. Of course, it might make it a little bit noisier, but I think that's a fair trade-off for the, uh, the longevity of the machine. So we'll pop that in today as well. So let's install that and then let's do the master CD restoration, plug everything in and hope that it just works out of the box with everything in, including the remote control and the media select. I hope it's just gonna pick everything up and work. Fingers crossed that it will. And then we will put it in situ in its new place. And then I've got to do a whole lot more to um, dress the area, dress the IBM PC compatibles area and pick some PCs to put in there just to finish off the episode. First of all, let's uh, restore it. Let's do that now. Let's get that fan installed then. And that's certainly gonna please some of you who noticed the old heatsink is not quite flush on the CPU. There's a lip. It's not quite in the CPU groove and some of you spotted that in the last episode. So hopefully this makes you feel better. I'll add a bit of extra thermal paste. That wouldn't go amiss here either just to get some more contact between the heatsink and the CPU, but not too much. So that's our heatsink and fan in and I've connected that up to the power. But when I put the sound and modem card back in, I noticed that the clearance above the fan is quite tight. It's not ideal having air blast straight into the card above it. But it should be fine because there's a front fan on the case here, so that's drawing air in and immediately pushing the air away from that top of that CPU fan. It all then feeds out to the PSU fan and out the back of the case. So I'll keep an eye on it, but I think this is gonna be fine. It's nice having the original sound card and modem in there, but I could always swap it out for a smaller one if it becomes a problem at a later date. Let's put that all back together now and put the lid on. And now I can take the Packard Bell over to its new home on the other side of the lab here. Let's put all these bits together now. So here's the media select unit. 
we plug the mouse into that, we pop it on top of the case, and I did notice that it's quite slidey on top of the case, even with the weight of a monitor on it. Might be worth adding some rubber feet or a mat underneath this. I'll keep an eye on it. This is our infrared sensor for the remote control. And then next to that is our microphone, all ready for action. And 1,000 pounds worth of software. I'll put our catalogue here so that's to hand if anyone wants to flick through it. And I think when you step back, it all makes for a really inviting mid-90s PC to test drive just as soon as I've got it working properly. So that's the next job. What I was missing for this process was a bootable floppy disk. There should be a Packard Bell recovery disk and you boot from that and then you run the CD. So I've had to make my own with CD-ROM drivers on it. And then when I browsed the CD, what I found was this BU01 folder. Now inside that is an ARJ or ARJ archive, which stands for Archived by Robert Young. It sounds like an aftershave I got for Christmas one year. And I could just format the hard drive and decompress this over to the hard drive. However, there's a couple of problems. One, it's password protected. And that's not really a problem because the password is easily found now after a, a quick search on the internet, it's public knowledge. But also I wasn't sure if I needed to decompress it all or if the recovery process was smart enough to know what model computer I had and then it would selectively restore parts of the archive. So let's do it properly and see what happens. The program we need is also on the CD, that's called OEM Setup. And then when we restore it, nothing smart is actually happening here. It's just dumping the entire archive onto my hard drive which is fine, now we know. When the archive's decompressed and after the first reboot, I did hit a snag. So it tried to run det cd or detect cd, an executable from Packard Bell, which seems to try and detect which CD-ROM drive you have. And then it would set the drivers up for it from a, a selection of different CD-ROMs that they included as standard. Now I've already upgraded mine to a newer 32 speed CD-ROM drive. So it just hangs at this part of booting. The workaround was to disable that line at startup and use the good old Oak CD-ROM driver and then things carried on as normal. It kicks into the second stage of the Windows 95 setup here where it detects hardware. All the drivers are present on the hard drive so I don't need to manually browse and tell it where the drivers are. And then shortcuts were added to the start menu for all the pre-installed apps. It's not bloatware remember, it's a thousand pounds of free software. Notice also how the default desktop background is for Mastercare. This was the servicing arm of Dixon's, which is where you likely bought this machine, and it's advertising a premium rate number which costs up to 49p per minute to get help if you need it. As if you'd not just spent enough buying the thing and bringing it home, here's a premium rate number to call. Anyway, after all that, our recovery is successful and our Packard Bell is running better than ever. The Navigator front end isn't even stuttering this time like it was before. The computer offers two computing environments to choose from, our Navigator home environment or Microsoft Windows. And if I head into the kids section of Navigator, I can play some games. Hello and welcome to Kidspace. This is the fun place to work and play. Keep your software in the bookcase. Put all your games and stuff on the shelves. Navigator isn't so bad on this machine, but it is helped by the huge RAM upgrade we gave it in the last episode to 48 megabytes. Even the top of the range model only had half that on launch. So this is as it was meant to be, but not necessarily the experience we actually had using Packard Bell's custom Windows front end Navigator. It's massively helped by the additional RAM. Anyway, I had a poke around. made a quick wallpaper change to save myself the temptation of that premium rate number. And now let's test some of the peripherals. I see you down there in the comments hating on Packard Bell. There's nothing wrong with a Packard Bell. You should learn to love it. The microphone seems to be working just fine. I see you down there in the comments hating on Packard Bell. Let's increase the volume on that so we can really hear the low quality of the mic. There's nothing wrong with a Packard Bell. You should learn to love it. And let's add a bunch of echo to it because it's pretty much the only option Sound Recorder gives us. I see you down in the comments hating on Packard Bell. There's nothing wrong with a Packard Bell. You should learn to love it. So that's good, but the remote control and media select panel weren't doing anything at all for me. So I had to dig into that. 
I found Windows was trying to call an executable named FM Thunk or FMT Hunk, which is a fast media program. That's what the FM stands for, and that was missing from my hard drive. Thankfully, the Master CD also has a menu to install individual components in Windows, and I found fast media was on the list. So I ran through that. I noticed also on the list was DirectX. Uh, that would be version 2. We're now all the way up to version 12, so that's quite an early version of DirectX here in 1996. So after all of that, my media select now works. I can speed down my friends using the panel via the modem and use the microphone to talk to them. Or I could if I had an analog landline here. And I can check voicemails, which would be saved on my hard drive. You have zero new messages. You have zero old messages. I can turn the FM radio on. I can adjust the volume. I can do all sorts of things with this panel. And it's the kind of thing that we'd later see built into keyboards. Some of these buttons would appear at the top of keyboards around this era as well, but I kind of like having them on separate buttons under the monitor. Sadly, the remote control still wouldn't work. I spent quite a lot of time trying to figure this out. I've come up short frustratingly, even though it seems to use the same drivers as the Media Connect. So I will keep trying, but we'll push on today. The remote control has eluded us. What each button does on the Media Connect can be easily customized with a registry entry, which is handy. So one change I made was I mapped the Internet button to Internet Explorer instead of AOL, which it was defaulting to. Let's try some of those CDs now. Echo the Dolphin. I think this must be based on the Mega CD version with added FMV sequences and music. And uh, it's also mouse controlled, which is novel, but it does work strangely well. Comic Zone also runs nicely. This is a game that was held in very high regard on the Mega Drive, and it plays really well on our system. A system that cost over 10 times the price of a Mega Drive, so it really should. But it's the reference CDs that really define this era of PCs. Get into grips with multimedia capabilities and mass storage on a CD, resulting in things such as this. Most people love lobsters for dinner, but if we want to keep catching them and eating them, we must protect them too. So our PC is now running really well, and I was enjoying trying out all of the bundled software. But soon, I wanted to give it a much more fitting setting for people to enjoy it in. It doesn't make sense to have this paired up with an Amiga 1000 or a PlayStation 2. I think those machines need to be out in the main museum space, and this needs to become a PC zone to really let it shine. So I need to clear it out, I need to clear the shelves, and I need to fill it up with PC-related goodies from the era. Let's get to work. The systems that are out here will chop and change, but today I've got my all-in-one compact PC. That's a 486, and it's a nice example of an early multimedia PC, ideal for a game of Myst, I think. The IBM NetVista is a Pentium 4 running Windows 98. Some of you may remember that as part of a charity haul. I got about 20 of these, cleaned them up and sold them on for charity. And this is one I kept for myself. I also dug out the older 486 Packard Bell Executive that's also appeared on the channel and was my first ever IBM PC compatible. I picked it up when I sold my Amiga in the early 90s. So this is an earlier generation of the very same Packard Bell we've just fixed up. Longer term, it would be really good to properly network all of these machines. On the shelves, whatever I can lay my hands on really to evoke memories of 90s PC use from Need for Speed to Encarta. I want people to feel the full force of nostalgia slap them in the face when they walk into this room. And these shelves really should help with that. So my question to you today, what would you put on these to achieve that? And is it any of these things that I'm putting up now? And with those final touches, the room was ready. Like every part of the cave, this too will evolve. 
This is our baseline now for our new PC area and it will only get better with time. But as nostalgia hits go, this is really doing it for me. Familiar games, lustworthy peripherals that were out of my budget, speakers of every shape and size, and CD-ROM drives of every speed. Tower PCs are also represented by our compact on the floor here with a 3DFX card in it. And we go up to the Pentium 4 era in that IBM with a matching keyboard, speakers, and IBM branded subwoofer on the floor. Yes, I know this episode is all about the Packard Bell, but this is its rightful place, rubbing shoulders with competing brands, just as it did in the stores on my high street. And it holds its own, I think. Whether I'm gaming or virtually exploring art galleries in Paris, this is exactly how I wanted to experience this PC and exactly how I wanted to end the series. That and the bundled Packard Bell karaoke app. That's what I really wanted to experience. Take care, thanks for watching, and please do take a moment to subscribe if you haven't already done so. And on that farm he had some cows E-I-E-I-O With a moo-moo here and a moo-moo there Here a moo, there a moo, everywhere